speaking along that theme, we want to talk about this morning, the model father. What is a model father? What is it? What are some of the qualities of a model father? And we're going to take an example from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. If you want to turn in your Bibles and get ready, we will be looking at that scripture in just a moment. But there was a little boy that came up to his dad and asked, Dad, who made God? And the father who was reading the paper said, Beats me, son. And a little bit later, the little boy asked, Dad, why is the earth round? And the dad answered, I just don't know, son. And the boy played for a minute longer, and then he asked, Dad, is, is there life on other planets? And the father patiently ad- answered, Nobody knows the answer for, of that for sure. And finally the boy asked, Dad, do you mind me asking all these questions? And the father put down the paper and said, Not at all, son. How else are you going to learn? Yeah. But all joking aside, you know, we need to ask the question, what are we teaching our children? What are we as fathers and mothers, as parents, what are we teaching our children? And I'm not talking about the reading, writing, arithmetic type of thing. I'm talking about what are we teaching them about God? What are we teaching them about life? What are we teaching them that's going to prepare them for their time after they've left the household? I mean, that's really our responsibility as parents. We're to prepare our children for that time ahead. And what are we teaching them? And what are our children learning from observing us as parents? What are they learning from us? As a father, speaking to fathers and and all parents, really, I want to tell you that I've made my share of mistakes, and, and I don't have all the answers to parenthood, but I want to share with you a few things here this morning about a father in the Bible who seemed to have it all together, um, at least uh, from the point of view of Jesus using this parable, this story. Um, he seemed to have it all together. And we find him in the parable of the prodigal son, again, from Luke chapter 15, 11 through 32. The father in this story is representative of God, God the Father. And as an example to us as to what kind of fathers we also should be. So that's a good source to go to. If this is an example of what God the Father is, it's a parable about God the Father, then that ought to be a model for us to look at and to, uh, to find some things from that verse of Scripture that we can use as fathers as well. So again, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 15 verses 11 through 32. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked him what was going on. 
Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we have had the, to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Number one I, that I want us to recognize about this father is that this father taught his son that he was approachable. He was approachable. By that I mean that his sons did not fear coming to him and speaking to him and talking to him about, about anything. Look at the first words this wayward son said after he came to his senses in the pig pen. Look at verse 18. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. His first thought was, I'll go back to dad. Even though I've done all of this, I know that I can go back to my father. Yeah, I may not be you know, the son again, but at least I can be hired on as a hand or something. But I know that I can approach him. I know I can go back to him. I know I can talk to him. Dads, are we the first ones our children think of going to when they're in trouble? Or are we the last that they think about going to when they're in trouble? You know, a lot of that depends on how approachable we've been for them over the years. How approachable have we been for them when they were in those times of trouble? As to whether they feel confident and comfortable to actually come to us. If every time they've come to us in the past, they found a grum grumpy and unforgiving father who shows little interest and who has little understanding or compassion, then we'll likely be the last one that they'll go to if they even come to us at all. But they'll try anything else before they come to you if that's the, the, the impression that they have, if that's the way they feel about coming to us as fathers. And had this father been that way, this son, this boy would have said something like, I would love to go home, but I know that's impossible. Dad will never understand. He'll never forgive me. And you know what? There are sons and daughters that are out there that are feeling that very same way. I can't go home. I can't go back. I can't wish to go back home because I'll find unforgiveness and, and I will not find compassion. He would never have been restored to his family if his father had not been approachable in that way. Dads, if our kids messed up like this son, if they squandered what we had given them, if we'd felt embarrassed by what they'd done, if we'd felt hurt by what they had done, and then they came to their senses and wanted to return to us, would they find a brick wall? Or would they find open arms welcoming them back to the family? How approachable are we, especially in those difficult situations? Well, this man, this son, felt confident enough to return to his dad. Did he expect to be restored to that, nor, that position he'd had before? No. He kind of had already given that up. He'd given that idea up. He knew there would be some consequences. He, he recognized that that was a real possibility, but he was still able to approach his fathers. And fathers, I know that it can hurt terribly when one of our children turned their back on and all that they've been taught, all that you've tried to instill in them, and when your children turn their back on that, that is hard. That hurts. I understand the depths of that pain that comes from, from that act, from that child doing that. But for the sake of our children, we need to remain approachable in the hope that they will come back to their senses and return and be restored back to the family. This approachability should be in us, whether it's, it's really serious or not. 
doesn't matter. Whether it's a little infraction, if you want to call it that, or, or something huge like this, they need to know that they can be approachable to their dad. Our kids are going to make mistakes. Our kids are going to disappoint us. That's just a given. That's just a given. It's, it's just rare that that doesn't happen. So we need to remain approachable. As our Heavenly Father is always approachable. No matter what we've done, we can always go back to God the Father. Number two, this young man knew that his father was spiritual. You may say, well, how can a man be spiritual if he loses one of his kids? Isn't that something that the Bible talks about? You know, you're supposed to have good kids and they shouldn't be leaving and they shouldn't be going off. Uh, surely that's evidence that the father had done something wrong, isn't it? Well, it could be, but that's not necessarily so. Let's think about that. This story was told to a group of scribes and Pharisees who were upset that Jesus was visiting and eating with sinners. Look at verse 2 of Luke 15, and you'll see that. That's what they were upset about. They were upset about the fact that uh, he was eating with sinners. What does it say? But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. This is what they were all upset about in the first place. Each character in this story represents certain kinds of people. The younger son represents the sinner who were uh, sinners who were coming to Jesus because he was approachable. Yes, this was the sort of called the dregs of society. These were the people that weren't the the uh, religious, they weren't the ones who were going to church. They weren't the good Jews of that time. They were the ones who were not so nice. But Jesus was approachable, and they were coming to him, and he was spending time with them. And this younger son represents those sinners who were coming to Jesus because he was approachable. And the older son represents the scribes and the Pharisees who thought Jesus should have nothing to do with them, They've squandered their lives. They've squandered the gifts that you've given to them, God. Don't have anything to do with them. They messed up. That's it. Cut them off. That's what the older son wanted to do. And who did the father represent? As I said earlier, the father represents God. And the story is showing us that God will accept a sinner back if he repents. God the Father is there with open arms. He does not just give up on us. And aren't we thankful for that? That all of us were able to come back to the Father and say, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Please accept me back into your family. And that's what God the Father is. And so if this Father represents God, is God unspiritual? kind of a uh, not a possibility there is it the son had been taught the truth the father hadn't shirked his responsibilities look at verse 21 the son said to him father i have sinned against heaven and against you i am no longer worthy to be called your son you see he knew the truth he knew what was right and most likely he was taught that by his father but you know what all of our children have free will they're capable of accepting the truth that we teach them as parents or they can ignore it. They have free will to do that. And we can't always control that. We'd like to. <clears throat> With our kids, we'd like to control everything in their lives to make sure that they're safe and make sure that they do all the right things and we want to control everything. We can't. We can't. All we can do is teach them, bring them up properly, give them all the wisdom that we can, and we've got to start releasing them as they get older and older, and eventually they're going to be gone. And all you can do is hope that the things that you've taught them will remain in them. So does it mean that you fail? Not necessarily. Some of you have watched helplessly as your children brought up to love and serve the Lord have gone their own way. They've drifted from the path that you taught them. 
the one that you wanted to control. But they have their own free will. And all you can do is take care of your responsibility to teach them properly while they're being raised. And then you've got to let them go and just pray for them. You just got to pray for them. But God, keep them safe. Keep speaking to their hearts. So does that mean that you failed? It may feel that way, but it's not necessarily true if they follow a different path. But if you neglected your responsibilities to them, if you failed to care for and and train your kids, then yeah, perhaps you are a failure. Whether they depart from you or not, you are. And you know what? Parents many times think that I just got to control them and I've got to hold on to them and I've got to just not give them any freedom and and I've got to make sure that they're just going to do what's right all the time. They hang on so tightly that the moment that child leaves that home, which will happen sometime, whether it's going off to college, whether it's uh, getting their own you know, apartment or whatever, they're eventually going to leave that home, and if all they've known is that control, and then all of a sudden they have all that freedom. So many times I've seen it. The kids just go, wild, wild, because now they can do whatever they want. They're not under the thumb of their mother or father or parents. They're just going to do whatever they want. We've got to learn to start letting them free a little earlier. During those teen years, we've got to start learning to let go a little bit and letting them, yes, make those mistakes. That we welcome them back into the family after they've made those mistakes and help to teach them to learn from those mistakes. But if you've taken your responsibilities seriously, if you've done your job and still the kid goes wrong and strays, you've done all that you can. And you need to not be holding any any guilt about that. Because let's think about that. Some of God's children have strayed, have disregarded the truth as well. Has God failed? Because we strayed? No. God's not a failure as our Heavenly Father because we strayed. Because we have free will to do that. And so you can't hold that responsibility either. And you might say, but, but doesn't Proverbs 22, 6 say, train a child in the way he should go and when he's old, he will not turn from it? Yes, the Bible does say that. But you know what? That's not a guarantee. It's not a guarantee. It's it's not a promise that your children will always turn out right. And it's not a judgment on parents whose children have strayed from the truth. A proverb is just a general truth, the way things will usually turn out, but it's not a guarantee. It's not an absolute promise. This father was spiritual. And fathers, we must be too. We are not to let our wife be taking the primary role of the religious person in the family. We can't just say, well, you take care of the religion in the family. Mom, I don't want to be involved with that. That's not my area. Yes, it is. It's your responsibility, as well as the mom. Both of you are. And I've shared the statistics before that when... Uh, a mother comes to church. There's a certain percentage that the children will come with them. I don't remember what the actual statistics were, but it's fairly low. That if the mother only attends church, you know, uh, the children will come. But if the father and mother, or even father only, is the one attending church, the statistics double as to how many of the, the, ch- uh, the children coming to the church as well. It's amazing the influence that fathers have spiritually on their children. We have to take that responsibility. It is our responsibility. And if you avoid it, don't be surprised at the consequence. Don't be surprised. Number three, this son knew that his father was compassionate. Compassionate. Look at verse 20, the second part of verse 20. It's in your outline 
But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Now how can a father feel compassion for a returning child who's squandered his estate? How can a father welcome a child who's dragged his reputation in the dirt and sped on everything he stood for? It's not easy. It's not easy. The older son was asking these very same questions. How can you do that? Look what he did. He ran off. He used all the money. He, he's just, and now he wants to come back? How can you welcome him back like that? The older son's asking these very questions. He, he's angry because his father has just accepted his younger brother back after all that he did. How can you do that? Look at the father's reply in verse 32. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. To him, the boy's arrival was like him returning from the dead. That's the way he looked at it. His possessions, his reputation, compared with his son's life and his restoration back to the family, it just didn't matter. That wasn't the important part of it. Dads, are we compassionate towards our children? When they mess up and when they repent, should we accept them back joyfully? Or should we distance ourselves from them and act like they're disowned? No. No. I don't want anything to do with you. Or do we welcome them with open arms? If we look at the example of this father, we have our answer. Yes, sometimes our children have to be rebuked. They have to be scolded. They have to be punished. They have to suffer some of the consequences of their actions and what they've done. Yes. But few of us respond well to being pushed away, driven away, or rejected. Is that the way we want to treat our children? It's never too late to change it and do it right. So fathers, I want to encourage you today to do it right. Do it like God the Father does, because God the Father has compassion on us when we come back, no matter what we've done, he welcomes us with open arms. He is the model father. And that's what we need to model our fathering, too, is God the Father. It's never too late to change. And think about this. Your children are learning how to parent from the way we are parenting them right now. So what kind of an example are they seeing? Are they seeing a model of being approachable? Are they seeing a model of you're very spiritual? You you understand that church and God and Jesus in your life is an important aspect in your heart and life. Do they see that? Do they see compassion from you when they have messed up and they have come back and said they're sorry? Have they found compassion, but have they found that brick wall of judgment? Have they found open arms or rejection? We need to be like God the Father, approachable, spiritual, compassionate. And our children are watching us as we parent, as an example of how they will be parenting their own children. So are they seeing an example of their Heavenly Father's love and compassion or a star, a stiff, hard, unforgiving father? Model fathers model themselves after their Heavenly Father. So may this be our prayer. I want to be just like you because he wants to be just like me. Fathers, you know that. You know that your children look to you. You know that they're modeling themselves after you. And if you're not modeling after God, they're not seeing the model that they need to see. So may that be our prayer. I want to be just like you, Father. Because he wants to be. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, what a great responsibility you have given to us. As parents, as fathers, Lord, we feel inadequate to the task. It's such an awesome responsibility. And Lord, perhaps we didn't have good models from our own parents. It's made it tough on us to be the kind of father that we know we should be. But it's never too late to change. It's never too late to say, Father, God the Father, please teach me how to father better. And he's given us this model. You've given us this model in your word. So, Lord, I pray for each father that's here. I pray that you will help them, strengthen them, encourage them, give them great wisdom to be the father that you want them to be. For it's in Jesus' name we pray.